these things, use those terms loosely, organised. Um, yeah, the Walthams Rock and Roll Book Club, we talk about music books. Um, we got Paul Hanley from The Fall. Can we have a big round of applause, Paul Hanley from The Fall? 40 years. 40 years. Still the fun that, um, you might as well say Paul Hanley from St Aidan's Primary School. <laughs> it is funny. Um, Paul's brother, Steve, who's read The Big Midweek by Steve Hanley? So you'll know, in, in fact, most fall books were introduced to Steve as a gangly 16-year-old yeah. drummer who Mark... Not me, Paul. Yeah. Paul, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who Mark is strangely protective of in his own way. In his own way he was a bit, yeah. yeah. So when I meet the 53-year-old man <laughs> that is before us, it does quite tally in my head. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here anyway, Paul. Thank you very Welcome much. to Waltham stuff. Thank you. I should use this really, shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, apologies to anybody who hasn't got a chair. Hello, Berta. Berta's come, everyone. She hasn't got a chair. I know. And it's really sad because Berta buys a ticket for every, every one of these things. And then a day before says, um, sorry, I'm not feeling very well. Uh, I'm not going to make it. And I feel really bad, especially because uh, I, I often forget to refund her ticket money. But there we go. Um, thank you for all coming. Um, we are going to talk about Paul's fabulous book, Leave the Capital, um, which is about... What's it about, Paul? It's not about criticising London in any way, I have to say that, rather. It's, it is, well, it is, so it's kind of, it's about every, well, I've been in trouble about this before, most books about Manchester music, and there are a lot of books about Manchester music, I have to say, I apologise on behalf of Manchester for that, but most of them, I mean, the vast majority of them start at, like, the sex, there's two Sex Pistols gigs at the Leicester Free Trade Hall in 1976, which were organised by Buzz Cox and Richard Doon, and most of them, I mean, it's a good jumping off point, but I, as I, I, I wanted to, I originally wanted to write about Manchester Studios, which I thought was quite a good subject, but as I researched it, I realised that there's like a whole kind of Old Testament, almost, to the New Testament that started with the Sex Pistols gigs, about Manchester music and not just, I'm talking about Manchester music, not in terms of just bands that came from Manchester, I'm talking about Manchester music in Manchester. And if you trace it back, it goes all the way back to a couple of the massive Manchester acts in the early 60s, a couple of the beat groups. And it's, well, there's a, there's a very famous quote from Tony Wilson, which basically says the reason Joy Division could do what they were doing is because a Manchester musician invested his money in building a studio, and he built uh, Strawberry Studio. And that, so I wanted to write about that. And as I looked into it, it turned out that, so there was Graham Goldman and uh, Eric Stewart of who were in 10 CC, Glenn Goldman was a songwriter, Eric Stewart was in the Mindbenders, and then they started Strawberry, but slightly less well known, there's, there were two of Herman's Hermits, um, you know, Keith Hotwood and Le Leckenbeer was his name, they started another studio, originally up the stairs from Strawberry, and that was Pluto, and if you, if you look at those two studios, which were both in Manchester, Sockport, I ca I'll call it Manchester, Great Manchester, and if you look at those, the bo all of your, those acts that, that started from the Sex Pistols gig all recorded in Manchester because of those two people, those two groups of people started studios. And it kind of, I know it's a, you can get start talking about the psychogeography of the whole thing. And this, I think there is some, there's something in the fact that those albums, the Smiths' first album, the Joy Division's first album, uh, were recorded in Manchester. So, you know, the Echo and the Bunnymen's first album wasn't recorded in Liverpool, or, you know, any of the other bands you wanted to care to mention, they weren't recorded in the hometown, and I think that's something that makes Manchester music unique. So that's that's what the book's about. You don't have to buy it now, you've just heard one. <laughs> what I thought you were going to say was this, because this is what you wrote. <laughs> this is the story of how records were made in Manchester, back when studios mattered. This is the story of music that couldn't have been made anywhere else in Manchester. But I think you... It's you the same thing, it's the bit. same it is. thing. But well, we're going to start, not at the very start, which you do in the book, because I do want people to read it. Oh, and the other thing, yeah. Um, we haven't got as many books as there are people here. And as an additional incentive, it was Paul's birthday on Monday. So everyone, please buy a book. There we go. Um, we're not going to start at the start, which is 1929, and then some shepherds. Yeah. People have to read that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we are going to start, I think, with... Um, Wayne Fontana. Yeah. So the first bit of the book, and this is what I found fascinating. So like many of us, I've read a lot of Manchester books. 
and most of those Manchester books do start in 1976. I'm vaguely aware of some of the people that are in here, mm -hmm. Herman's Hermits, yeah, the Hollies, yeah. and, but not so much about Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders. Yeah. So I thought maybe, remind us just how successful Manchester bands were across the world, and especially in the United States, in 1964 and 65. Well, yeah, there and was. Who led that? Yeah, well, there, there was, there was, there was. First of all, there was Herman's Hermits. They were the first to really get big in America. And there was, then there was Freddie and the Dreamers, and there was Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders. They all started around about the same time because there was a massive, uh, similar to Liverpool, there was a massive sort of beat club scene in Manchester. Loads of places to play, loads of bands, and. They, they kind of grew from skiffle, where they, and then they, they all made a bit of money, and they all started buying electric instruments. So, but so the first there was, I think Herman's Hermits was first. They had I'm into I'm into something good. But then there was Wayne Fontana, the Mindbenders were. He was they, they, he had a band. Funnily enough, Wayne Fontana had a band called the um, I can't think what they were called now. But he, uh, they left it. He had an audition for Fontana Records, and his band all left him the day of the audition. So they set the bass player. Bass player stuck around. So he was at this club, at the Oasis Club in Manchester, and he had no band, and he had a major record label, because Fontana was part of, um, I can't think which one, uh, Columbia, I think, no? Phillips Group. That was it, Phillips, sorry, yeah. So it was a big... Never occurred to, and the Beatles did that, obviously the Beatles were the ones, but it was never a person in a band's job to write songs, that was somebody else's gig, that, that, wasn't, what, that wasn't what people in bands did. And the Beatles did that, because where, what, where Eric... Uh, where the Mindbenders really struggled was getting songs that matched the band. They get given all these pop songs, and they were really an R and B group, really. So and why they never, well, why no one, of, none of them ever said, "Well, I'll tell you what, let's write our own." It never occurred to them really. So they were always at the mercy of these songwriting teams, as all the Manchester bands were. And so they did the Groovy Kind of Love, and that got to number two. So then, but that was it for them really. So then the other massive band in Manchester was Freddie and the Dreamers, who were a bit of a joke. Really. They were, I mean, they, had, they, they were daft, you know, he'd drop his pants and they'd have all these daft dances and all that. And they were a bit embarrassing, really. But then the, one, the ones who came along, really, and who were the sort of pinnacle of Manchester music were the Hollies, really. The Hollies were just fantastic. But again, they didn't write their own songs. And one of the main things, points in the book is where Manchester music really got its own voice is they had a brilliant songwriter on hand in Manchester, uh, Graham Goldman, who wrote for... The Hollies, he wrote for Herman's Hermits, he wrote for Fred and the Dreamers, and he wrote for the Mindbenders as well. And he, he made it possible for Manchester bands to speak with a Manchester voice. Hey, was, I'm, I want to read this now, it sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound good. It is good. The reading, Paul's chosen a, a reading. That would remind about me Graham Goldman, yeah. I have, yeah. Is it about Graham? Yeah. I think it's appropriate we, we look at Graham now. So yeah, as yeah. you say, he's the one... He's the genius, isn't he? He is, Songwriting yeah. genius. We recognise that that now. Yeah. But it, it was it was never easy. I mean, and you point this out. Um, even even with some past success, it wouldn't guarantee that your next record, the record company would say, actually, yeah, you got yeah, to yeah. award with that. Have another crack yeah. at it. Yeah. Well, the, the weird thing about Greg Gorman is he had a band called The Whirlwinds, and he wrote For Your Love uh, for The Whirlwinds. And they went to the record label and said, they, designed, they only signed for one single, and they went, they said, well, we've got our own song, we want to do it, it's called For Your Love. And they recorded it, and the record said, no, we're not having that, uh, we need to do something else. So they had some other song that, that he, he kind of wrote in a bit of a hurry. But he, he, was massive, he loved For Your Love, and his manager, a guy called Harvey Lisberg, who was another hero of Manchester music, they, they, this, they had this company called Kennedy Street, who did promotions, and they were behind all the Manchester fans. And the, I think one of the real selling points for the Kennedy Street managers is you've never heard of them. You've heard of all their acts and you've heard of all the people they looked after, but they're not like Peter Grant or, you know, they're not like um, Robert Stigwood or any of them. They weren't big in their own right. They were content to have big acts. So that was a big thing. So the, the record company turned them down for Foyer Love. They gave them a new song that they did and it tanked completely. Band split up. So Ivy Lisbeth said, I'm not having this. this that Foyer Love's the number one. And he said, tell you what, we'll get it, we'll give it the Beatles. And Graham said, well, why would you give it the Beatles? They don't, they write their own songs, they're not looking out for songs. They said, no, no, this is, this is good enough, we'll get them to the Beatles. So he got this uh, guy and he said, take it to the gig, take this tape, the, the demo of the uh, Whirlwind's doing this, that they wouldn't have as a single, take it to the, the Beatles and say, do this, it'll be a massive hit. And he's taking it to the Beatles, no chance. And he gave it to the support band, who happened to be the Yardbird, 
and they did it, and it was a you know massive hit. And it's exactly the same. You, you can hear the uh, Whirlwind's version of it, and it's got all that. The only thing I haven't got is the harpsichord that's all really, really good harpsichord bit. But I mean, it's the same song. It would have been a hit, but it was just because Nepo Company people had cloth ears and they didn't like bands telling them what they wanted to record. I think that's been. Read us a little bit about Graham then. Well, right, then. Sorry, I've got a boom stamp. Yeah. I was debating with my wife before which of me, I've got two pair of glasses, which one made me look more awfully. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, neither, you just look like a drummer with glasses on. So, <laughs> I'm not sitting here, Paul. You strike me, you've got a little bit of a look of Paul Mason, the political journalist. <laughs> about, uh, side. Okay, I'll take your word for that. I don't know what Paul Mason looks like. Not Paul Merson, the footballer. No, 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 not, not him. He's got a bigger nose, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> So, on his lunch break at the fitting room of Bargains Unlimited, the Salford Gents outfit is where he worked, Graham Goldman wrote two tracks for his new band, The Mockingbird's first release. Quickly proving what he had, what he had what it took to be a major songwriter, he created the genu genuinely innovative For Your Love by simply pilfering the chords from House of the Rising Sun and changing the rhythm. At that time, every guitarist in the country was ripping off House of the Rising Sun. So it's a mark of Goldman's innate talent that For Your Love has endured as long as its progeny has. Even as he turned the shop back from closed to open, Goldman knew that he had a hit on his hand, which is more than Columbia did, because they preferred his other offering, that's how it's going to stay for the A-side. Determined not to waste for your love as a B-side, Goldman came up with a distinctly Beatlesque I Never Should Have Kissed You virtually on the spot. It was frustrating to say the least. What he needed was someone to champion his songs and give them the push they needed. For that he turned to Harvey Lisberg. Lisberg was something of a visionary. With very little evidence, he recognised that Graham had a talent that would take him beyond the Mockingbirds and cement both their places in Manchester history. He was convinced that For Your Love was a potential hit, and more importantly, that there would be more where that came from. He encouraged Graham to work at his songwriting by placing him on a small retainer while he began to hone his skills. Thus done, Lisberg created additions where Manchester bands that couldn't write their own hits could still bolster writer with the same background, experience and mindset as them. Thank you very much. Thank I think you. we should record this. Well, it's, it's only a man reading. It's not, you, know. <laughs> you go on. There's a funny story you say about Graham Goldman. Um, I think it's, it's Harvey Lisberg who recognises he's got some talent. Yeah. He says, so, "So how do you write your songs?" And he, tell us that story. He's about being on the bus. No, it was it was Harvey Lisberg's partner, who, and they were on the. the, the what you used, you used to have to do in those days was go down to London and try and sell his songs, like you know, basically like they were floor polish or medical cleaner or something and go around all these publishing houses so he'd be going around all these publishing houses and saying I've got this song and then ten minutes later the Hollies would be coming in saying have you got any songs I mean he, he could have talked to each other back in Manchester <laughs> and saved everybody a journey but they never did so he was going down on the train and uh, the, the, the guy Charles Silverman his name was said well how do you write your songs and he said I just look about you know just look around and see what there is so the guy said well you could literally just look through any window and find a song <laughs> and he said yeah Look through any window, and he wrote the song. And he was such a nice bloke, Graham Goldman, because he got the idea from that conversation. He credited Charles Lisberg with the, uh, Charles Silverman with the song. So if you look at it, it's Goldman Lis uh, Silverman. So that was how he did it. So that was his first big one. He gave that to the Hollies, which was I mean, there's uh, there's a bit in the book where there's four songs, which are basically that song, Look Through Any Window, Bus Stop, uh, No Milk Today, and East West. Two of which are by the Hollies, two of which are by Herman's Hermits, and I reckon if they'd have been done by a band, they don't say they'd all been done by the Hollies, and Graham Goldman had been a member of the Hollies, you'd be remembering them as much as you remember any Beatles song from 1964, because those four songs are the match of any... It's just because they were spread out with different, back to different bands and they didn't write them themselves. They don't, I don't think they quite get the recognition that they deserve. And the other thing that always amazed me about Graham Goldman is... Whenever you read, I went back when I was Richard. What you read interviews with 10 CC in like 1975, and they never mention it. He doesn't. Like, he didn't say like I was one of the great songwriters of the 60s. And Eric Stewart never says, "Oh, well, I had two uh, top 10 American singles." They're kind of embarrassed by it in a way, which is which is bonkers. Especially today, the, when the, the whole thing people do is sell themselves all the time. They just sort of kind of mumbled about being in, they've been in bands a long time, which is I find incredible to be honest. But you give them justice uh, in this book. I mean, because yeah, but they need more justice than my book. Don't they? Well, yeah. it's a start. It's a start. It's yes, a start. I, I hope so. But there's a whole chapter, as you, you know, you've just given us a hint on it, um, about Graham Goldman, and those they're inter intertwined. Uh, yes. Eric Stewart, and, and and really, I mean, the first chapter, I say, for me, worked for me because it introduced me to stuff that I, I didn't mm -hmm. know about, yeah. which is what I always want from a from a music music book. 
Um, and you come away with this admiration for Goulburn and for yeah. and for Stewart. So their their paths do cross yes. um, because obviously they're they're working working together, and then they decide. Why? Why do we keep going to London? Let's make our own studio. Yeah, that was so Eric. It, so let's. That was Eric Stewart's thing. Well, the Mindbenders kind of they started off with uh, "Goody Kind of Love." That was their first single without um, uh, Wayne Fontana. But they never really recaptured that, really. And so then, as the sixties went on, I think people got to like pe people were faced with a choice. Really, they either carried on, or a lot of them went into sort of cabaret. So you either went to be an albums band like the Beatles did, like the Rolling Stones did, like the Who or whoever, or a lot of them fell by the way, so they went to cabaret, so Peter knew, well he was born to be in cabaret really, as was Wayne Fontana, and he was a sort of natural sort of joker, and, and the Freddie, uh, Freddie in the Dream of he was cabaret from day one, but it never really, it never really sat right with Eric Stewart, that, going around the clubs and pubs, you know, and Batley variety and doing cover versions of things and having to get off for the bingo. So then he, he wanted to do something else, he did, obviously he wanted to carry on with music, and um, he had a friend who ran this, like, basically a demo studio above a music shop. Because there was a few demo studios. There was no professional studios anywhere outside London in 1967. There was nowhere. Everything was in London. And Eric said, he, this guy was, he had, he'd been kicked out of this music shop because they wanted to put a staff canteen in. So he said, I want to carry on. And Eric said, well, why don't we do it properly? Let's do a proper studio. What, a proper studio outside London, you mean? It never occurred to anybody. So they really struggled because they went to the bank and said, we want to build a studio, a proper studio. Where people went, you might as well be saying, we want to build a rocket. Mm -hmm. Nobody does that. But they did it, and they found these premises in Stockport, of all places. And the, it was nothing. It was completely empty, this place. So he got, you know, they got the cement mixer out. And they, Eric Stewart did it. You know, he, he built everything. He put it the wine. He was a grafter, wasn't he? He was a grafter, yeah. yeah. He, he did, he'd done a design uh, 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 course, sort of mail order design course, and he'd done a bit of interior design in Harvey Lisberg's house and things. So he designed the studio, and he built the whole thing from scratch. And, and he spent every last penny on it, really. And he was to the point where he was, he was at one point, he was going to have to sell his house, and to, so to make a bit of capital to carry on the studio. And so they bought this new desk. This like uh, I think it was an eight track desk. They'd, they'd had two four tracks laid right. together, and they. It, the last of his money he bought this eight track and they were trying it out one night and they, they, they had the drummer playing it was then he was um, what's his name uh, you know Kevin, uh, Kevin Godley yeah, Kevin Godley was playing this drum beat and he had to play it for hours because he, he, he'd never used this desk before so he'd just keep playing and he'd tweak it and, he, and like two hours later and he said I'm going cr crazy here I can't carry on playing like this so, and then, so then Lol Cream and well, I'll play along, and he started playing along, and he starts playing this nursery rhyme. I'm a Neanderthal man, you're a Neanderthal And they started playing this nursery rhyme, and they're playing, that's great, that's something. They started overdubbing it, and they overdubbed the drums about 15 times, got about 12 guitars on it, wiped half of it by accident while they were still working out. And then in the end, they had this, I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to call it a song, really, because it's not really a song. But then, as, the, as, it, as luck would have it, some guy from Fontana, who they'd known for years, so, are you really building a studio up north? Yeah, I'll come in and have a listen. What can I listen to? And he said, uh, well, we've got this that we did last night. We were setting up the desk and they twitched it on and it was near the phone. And he said, that's a hit, that. And it sold two million copies. So, oh, I'm not selling my house now. <laughs> Took his house off the market and then they reinvested that. And that's what they did all along. And whenever, they, I mean, they, obviously, they kept the money as a band, but any money that the studio made went back into the studio. Well, they had time in the studio to do these little experiments yeah, yeah. and mess around. And we'll talk... A little bit. We all know about Not In Love, yeah. um, the big, big hit. And the, I think you say in the book, the time they spent experimenting in the studio yeah. leads to that. Yeah. But the, a studio is a commercial concern. Yeah. You've got to make some money. Yeah. Um, and they struggle for a little bit, I think. But then they get a, a little bit of a break and they, they managed to persuade a famous uh, singer-songwriter to go. They did, yeah, that was crap. Well, they did. Um, the first one they had in was, um, what's his name? Way to Amarillo. Who's that guy? Tony, Tony Christie. Tony Christie. Well, he, he was from up north, and he recorded that, and it's a it's a Neil Sedaka song, and he recorded it at uh, Strawberry. So, Harvey Lisberg, who, who, as we know, is already trying to sell <laughs> sell a song to the Beatles. He was he, he got involved in pushing Strawberry, and um, he went to Neil Sedaka and said, "You should come to my lad's studio. It's great. Well, where is it?" And he said, "Well, it's just outside Manchester." <laughs> 
I thought we were just outside Manchester. And he said, well, listen, mate, you've been dead on your arse for the last five years and you've not had a hit. You, the last hit you had was Tony Christie. He did uh, Amarillo, and he recorded I in Manchester, and for somehow, so I don't know how he could send, you know, he could sell uh, Eskimos bridges, but he, he convinced Neil Sedaka to come to Stockport and record an album, and if you listen to the album, it's really good, it's kind of, it's that, this sort of melancholy kind of term, which is quite a thing with Manchester music, there's this sort of melancholy air about it, which, which is similar to, you know, other people who've come to Manchester, and the Manchester Act, and he, it was really, really successful. And he did an album there, and he was really happy. He really got his uh, mojo back. And he did another album there as well. With and once since he said, "Well, we're not, you're not paying us the buttons you paid us last time. We want a decent thing." And he came back and he did two albums, Neil Sedaka. And he, his career never really looked back after that because he was a big songwriter in the '60s, but he couldn't get arrested in the early '70s. So and then they revitalised his career, which obviously then everyone said, "Well, why do we need? Why do we need to go? They've got this fantastic studio up in Stockport. We'll go there." And then they did. So and then after that. Even uh, they even got Paul McCartney across the door because um, Mike Mike McGee, as he was called then, Mike McCartney, he recorded a solo album there and he got Paul McCartney into a uh, record there, which was like Eric Stewart's life's ambition to get a Beatle across the threshold of Strawberry, and he did it. So, and then, as I say, the, the thing that moved on from there is the, what they used to do. They used to sell cheap downtime at the weekends, so you could go in Saturday night when nobody else was in, and the they did a deal with Tony Wilson to record the first Joy Division album, which they did. All, I think they did over three weekends, overnight or whatever, and they recorded the first. Joy. But the big thing, and a massive thing about it, is the reason that Joy Division album sounds like it does is because of Strawberry Studios, because of the way they set the studio up. There was a there were, um, Eric Stewart was a big admirer of, of Steely Dan, and the big thing they had was rather than stick a mic in a room and get the sound of the room. What you would do is you would create a room that was completely and utterly dead, so you, there'd be no reverb, nothing. It'd be completely dead. So they clad the wall with this pine, and, you, and, then, and then that gives you the freedom to build your own ambience electronically, basically. So you don't use any real echo, you don't use any real reverb. Everything is then added on afterwards, which is, I think, um, uh, Barney Bernard described it, it's like communism, it, it's a good idea in principle but it never works, which, which was his theory. But it did work, it did work and it was exactly what Martin Hammett wanted, that was what he wanted, he wanted everything to be out of his head. And famously, when they recorded the first Joy Division album, they hated how it sounded. Because it didn't sound like they did live, if you ever saw Joy Division live, they were, they were not, not quite heavy metal, but they were certainly a lot more energetic and revved up than they sound on the album, because the album sounds like it sounds like human beings trying to be craft work in some ways, you know, it's like a, it's not like real, it's not like a band in some ways, it's like people trying to sound like machines, trying to sound like human beings, it's, it's, it's different, shall we say, and that was Martin Hammett's vision and it was only possible in Strawberry, I think, couldn't have been done anywhere else, even if you listen to Osa, that's done in Britannia Row, in, which is a proper professional studio with lots of live rooms and all that, and it's a great album, and it's, it might even have better songs on it in some ways, but it's not. Unknown Pleasures is some. I mean, I'm banging on now, but I, mean, I could write a book about it. But Unknown Pleasures is some, there's something in Unknown Pleasures that is unique, and without getting too sentimental about it, the fact that a Manchester musician used the money he made, built a studio in a certain way, which enabled a Manchester band to record an album with a Manchester genius like Martin Hannett, all in Manchester, is worth writing about, I think. And there is a very good chapter in the book entirely about that. It so is, I, I could read it. I could bang on about that, yeah. But as you, you, you hinted at, uh, Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman weren't alone in this. There were a couple of other musicians yeah. from Herman's Hermit who had a similar idea. Yeah. Uh, and they formed the perhaps lesser known, uh, until this book came out, Pluto Studios. Yeah. Well, Pluto, they, they had some downtime, because Peter Noon always had one eye on his solo career, he, so he did. He did films. He did. He did Pinocchio when he was 21. He played the puppet with Burl Ives as Geppetto. He didn't give. A, he didn't give a shit. He, he'd do anything basically. He was Mr. Showbiz. Started off in Coronation Street. Uh, so he was off doing this, and so they were basically sat around with nothing to do. And they said, "Well, why don't we buy a decent tape machine and make our own demos?" Because they used to write. They used to write songs, but they, they'd only give them the B sides or album tracks. So they said, "Well, if we get a studio." 
because they tried out this one that, that was above the shop that Eric Stewart was, and, and that was crap apparently so they weren't going there so we will buy our own we could do better than that and they did it and then he had it in his house uh, and, he, and he said I'm not, I'm not keeping it <laughs> it's fine. I don't think his family were too best pleased with that about having the tape machine so they rented they rented some premises uh, above Strawberry funnily enough and they built their own studio called Pluto and they initially benefited because they were slightly cheaper than strawberry, so people would go into strawberry and they'd say, "What? Well, it's well, it's eight quid an hour. <sighs> I'm not paying eight quid an hour. Well, you can go upstairs for a fiver." So they did that, and then the other thing they benefited from was Eric Stewart. Every time he got five pence, he'd throw out the old stuff and buy something new. So they said, "Oh, we'll have that." So they got everything it cost and just took it up the stairs. So they did that, and the the big the big thing that made them successful was they started doing advertising. They had this guy work there, and he said, "Because in those days." advertisements on TV, especially with Granada being up the road, there was just a, a guy reading a script, uh, you know, come to uh, Timothy White's and this guy, he'd come back from America and he, was, he used to work for uh, Hermit's Hermits and he said, they've got this thing in America now, they've got these cartridges whereby you can put a pulse on them and so you can trigger the pictures and it, or you can trigger whatever you want but you can have proper sound, you can have music on there, whereas before it was just a guy talking about adverts. So they did that and they were first in the country to do that. And they got a contract with Granada and they got a contract with all the other ITV. So then they, they had enough money to keep their studio going then. So what they did for the whole of Pluto's life was subsidise bands by their advertising revenue. And then he, so that it meant you could get a really decent studio quite cheaply because it was subsidised by advertising. And then around, I think it was 1977, they had, a, they had their first real big hit, which was Matchstalk Men and Matchstalk Cats and Dogs was recorded there. And that was, you know, that had a choir on it, it had a brass band on it, and it was done in this tiny little 30 foot by 30 foot room above Strawberry. How they got a brass band in there, I have no idea. They must have had to have people hanging out the window. <laughs> but they got the brass band in it, and they got a massive number one, and it was an Ivan Novella Award winner. And then that, his big ambition then was, well, let's have a studio smack in the centre of Manchester. Because no one had done that. You know, Stockport was the nearest you got. With strawberry, so they bought these premises on Granby Road, which is just near the university, and they bought uh, this studio and they set up a 24 track studio in there. And basically, it meant that people could record in the centre. Imagine the, the Clash recorded there, Clash did Bank Robber there. We'll and talk about that in a sec. I mean, okay. the, um, the second half of the book, or is it maybe the second two thirds, is given over to the key tracks. Are there 13 in total? The 13 tracks in the whole book, but four of those... Oh, the Graham. No, no, five of those are before... Yeah, yeah. So, it's so half, the, half. half the book is about the, what you consider, and I think many here would also consider, the key defining tracks, recording those two studios. Yeah. And you just mentioned uh, Match Dog Men and Captain Dog. <laughs> and one of them, we can't, can't look at all of them, and uh, I've thought tonight we wouldn't focus on... Joy Division's Unknown Pleasures, because that's well known, but you've already done that. Yeah, um, but the, the Clash's bank, bank robbery is a fascinating yeah. story, yeah. Um, because of who it introduces. And I don't know how well known this story is. But tell us about the Clash going into Pluto to record bank robbery. Well, the Clash famously never took a day off. They were complete and utter workaholics. They had no existence, really, when they weren't working. And they, they did secret gigs, or they do, you know, install appearances, or they do, whenever they had a day off, they did something. And they, they played, uh, and so when they played in 1979, they did a secret, secret gig at Rafters. And then, so when they got, to, sorry, when they, at the end of 1979, they had like three days off in Manchester, and it wasn't worth them going home. So they said, well, we're going, we'll, we'll record something. They came up with this fantastic idea that we we're going to release a single every month for the year, which was never going to work. It's never going to be a non. It was always going to be a non-starter. But they had this, and before anyone could talk about it, they booked themselves and well, let's get the first one done quick before anyone talks about out of it. Now, the, the history of Bangor was quite interesting because if you, if you listen to them playing it live before they recorded it, it's like a sort of jolly scar number. They're quite fast and quite lively and quite bouncy. But when you hear the record, it's got like that Joy Division sort of shuffle on it like you'd get on um, I Remember Nothing or something. It's, it's almost like the atmosphere of Manchester has made them record it as this like heavy dub kind of thing. Well, that's what I argue in the book. You can argue against I, it. Well, I, I'd have said Mikey Dread was yeah. perhaps as yeah. much an influence on yeah, that. He, as... Yeah, but he didn't. He didn't change the drumming. He didn't. He might have changed the production. The production's quite heavy, dub, But uh, the song itself has got like I a just song. remembered you're a drummer. I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> there you go. I, I, it's, I it's, can got see. A, it's got a weight. It's like it's, it's like it's got the 
weight of the world on its shoulders when it, it didn't really start off like that. But the other interesting thing about that is the night they recorded it, they did it in Manchester overnight, and Ian Brown, who was a massive, massive Clash fan, he said the Clash are in town, they're recording, well, they must be at Pluto, because there's nowhere else. They, 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 they knew they were in the centre of Manchester, and they knew vaguely where vaguely where Pluto was. It's not easy to find, actually. It's, even, it's gone now, but even then it was like a... I lived around the corner. Yeah, I had yeah. no idea. No, no, it's it like was... a very nondescript doorway on this row of Granby Row, near the old Garrett, if any of you remember the old Garrett. <coughs> it was not far from the factory offices on Charles Street. No, that's right, yeah, just around the corner from there. So You all know that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Ian Brown and um, Pete Garner, who was the bass player at the time, well, we'll find them because you know we've got nothing else to do. So they went into town and they, they sort of they knew it was it's somewhere around there. So they sat outside, pissing rain in the family, and, and uh, next thing they heard, oh, that's that's drumming there. So they followed the sound and the door opened, and somebody went in, scolded in quick, and they knocked on the door. And they, they, it'll tell you everything you need to know about the clash. They knocked on the door, two like fifteen-year-old kids or whatever, and the clash in. Yeah, yeah, can we come in? Yeah, come in. And they let, let them stay all night. They stayed there like, and they watched them record it. And then that, so that's what cemented, I think, for Ian Brown, that the Clash is the greatest group in the world. And I think that's kind of what he took with him. So the Clash in Manchester was what made him make, make the Stone Roses. Really. And there's a not, the fact that Ian Brown is there is a nice thing, and it's a gift, because one of the other bands were jumping on a little bit, but of course it's the Stone Roses, yes. because they did record their first single, with Martin. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, at the strawberry. strawberry. Yeah. yeah. Why didn't they go to Pluto? I don't know. Because... Uh, just, struck my, just struck me then. Martin, 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 Martin loved... No, Martin Annett's favourite studio was yeah. Uh, yeah. Strawberry. He, that, he loved to record there. So they, they, I don't think they'd have had any choice in the matter, to be honest. They, they, it was Martin. If you wanted Martin Annett, you went where he said it. You did what Martin Annett said or you didn't get Martin Annett, I think. I don't want to focus on Stone Roses just now, but um, the other... Neat thing here is the Smiths. Yes, because they record of both Pluto. Yes, they did. Yeah, and, and Strawberry. So tell us, they record their first single. Yeah, they did. You the first, tell me what they did because I've forgotten. They that. did the first single at Strawberry, which yeah. was Hand in Glove, and they did the first album at Pluto in Manchester. And very famously, there was where they had. Or, well, it depends who you ask. It's where they either had the discussion about the split not being. 25, 25, 25, 25, or nothing was ever discussed whatsoever, and it was a complete news to Mike Joyce and uh, Andy when it turned out later on that that's what the split was. But according to Johnny Marr, according to Morrissey, they, Morrissey insisted that the split should be 40, 40, 10, 10, and they, according to them, the other two verbally agreed it. And interestingly, when they took it to court, the judge said, well, a verbal agreement's not worth the paper it's written on, as the, as the saying famously goes. If you've got an agreement that flies completely in the face of all known business law that four partners don't get a split each, then you're going to have to write it down. If you've not written down, you can get one. And he famously described Morrissey as not particularly the nice person. I think a truculent and not like kind of petting, I can't remember that. I Tony, anyway. Tony Wilson used to say he was a cunt. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was warned by my wife not to swear. I was sorry, worried sorry, about we're, in, we're in the south, we're very, very cold. I, sl I, sl I, I slept a shit in before I was worried. <laughs> it's reporter. You can't use the C word. That's yeah. terrible. Well, well, I mean, if there's anybody you were going to use it about, I think Morrissey would, <laughs> would be the one because he, he has very few redeeming features and. As days go on, he's getting less and less, I think. But anyway, but they famously recorded their first album at Pluto. And the reason they did, because it was cheap. And Rough Trade um, did a deal with Pluto and got a cheap rate. Similar rate to a, another album that was recorded at Pluto just before, which was Perverted by Language by The Fall. And that was recorded at Pluto. And then the Smiths, so the Rough Trade had a good deal with uh, Keith Hopwood, whereby they get cheap studio time. A lot of lot of little funny asides and turns of phrase in, in the book, which I, I think is the reflection of Paul. And, and there's, you do say about Johnny Marr, obviously, going down to see Jeff Travis and kind of inveigling him and, and getting an audience. And yeah. you said, I was on Rough Trade for three years. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. tell me. <laughs> no, well, yeah. Johnny, uh, one of the points in the book is one of the reasons, the main reasons I think that the Smiths did as well as they did was Johnny Marr he was, and his personality. If you look at the rise of the Smiths, they did nothing. You know, they all went to the same school, didn't you? I went to, I went to college with Johnny. I never spoke to him. But, uh, 
That's another story. Who yeah. else was there? You say it was me you... there. Johnny Marr was there, and Jim, the bass player, and James. We were all there at the same time, and everybody, everybody knew who Johnny Marr was. Um, he was like the sort of celebrity. This is before. He wasn't in a band. Well, he was in a band, but he wasn't a famous band. But he was the celebrity of this of Withenshaw College, and he was on a TV program. There was a TV program where it was like a it was like 60, pe 60 young people having a debate, a bit like Question Time, where they'd have these debates. Gus McDonald, I think it was, did it. And he was on there then. He goes, oh, it's Johnny, he's been on the telly, yeah, and everybody knew Johnny Marvel. And famously, in uh, the Severed Alliance, the book, he was obsessed with Tolly Wine at the time, while he was at college. He never mentioned it to me over the <laughs> bloody uh, pudding. He knew, so he, he knew my records, he didn't have any records out, and he was famous for that. Nobody knew who I was. Or Jim, for that matter. My Jim, the James weren't famous then, so he's got an yeah. excuse. So he, was, so he went down to London, armed with this tape of Hand in Glove, and he walked into the record shop. Now, you, you're lucky to get someone in rough trade to speak to if you're trying to buy a record. <laughs> <laughs> they could ignore you all day long. They certainly ignored me. I never had so much as a cup of tea when I went. And he went in there, and he got to see Jeff Travis, who was the head honcho at rough trade. And he got a promise from Jeff Travis that he'd listened to it over the weekend, and he got a phone call on Monday morning saying, yeah, we're going to put it out. Now, just how bonkers that is. If you'd go into Rough Trade, they wouldn't give you the time of day in Rough Trade. So he, must, he was quite the hustler. And I think that, and that's the thing. I always, I always say about Morrissey, what has he got to moan about? Johnny Mann knocked on his door and said, I'm going to make, I'm the greatest guitarist in Manchester. <laughs> I am going to make you an absolute su superstar. You are never going to have to do a day's work in your life. By the way, I've got a manager here who is the nicest bloke on earth who will pay for it. I'll get us a record deal. And he's never happy, is he, what say? What did he want? <laughs> <laughs> the chapters on the recordings are... You do break them down, don't yes. you? Do, it's track by track. Um, and again, in, insightful for me... Even some of the stuff, like, you know, the, the stuff, the Smiths books, there's many of them. Yeah. I've read Johnny Rogan, read all that, but I still found it fresh and something interesting because you're bringing a, a musician's perspective and also a Manchester yeah, yeah. perspective. That's the key thing, I think. So that's very good. Sorry, is this, this is the persuasive bit. This is the buy the book. Yeah, they're, not they're not decided by now, they're not going to <laughs> I've discovered this over, we've done about 50 of these. I said, um, say to Waterstone, I said, you know what, we should really try and get people to buy it before the talk because loads of authors just themselves out to a book. Really? Yeah. Oh, we're doing so far. Are we doing all right? We'll know when those are still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the wobbly leg on this table. This one of them. <laughs> but yeah, so we we talk about the Smiths, or you talk about the Smiths and Joy Division on the yeah. stages. I don't want to skip over the Buzzcocks, but I feel nope. we might skip over. But I do want to if talk... If you call them the Buzzcocks again, I'm yeah. going to get very, very oh, annoyed indeed. I love this. You picked me up on this, rightly, because we know it is Buzzcocks. And... I found a bit in your book where they are referred to as the Buzzcocks. <laughs> no, no, you don't. I have. I'm I'm not, I was going to get. I was going to get a big telly screen I mean, and just pull. Are you it sure up it's there. not the Buzzcocks sound or the Buzzcocks album? Or it's. I'm telling you, I'll be. I'll be really, really annoyed if you found me. <laughs> After this, if you want to join us, I was going to suggest we go along to uh, the Old Canard Cinema Mirth for a pint. I'm going to troll through this. I think if they're on the phone, on the Kindle, I'll dig it out. I'm almost certainly going to be wrong on this. Those of you who know... I really, 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 really <laughs> hope you are wrong. Right, we'll see. This could make, make up the, the night one way for an order. Well, funnily enough, Steve Diggle calls him the bus cop. Well, he's, he's right. right. He's, right. he's <laughs> not right. He's not right. What does he know? He's only been in for years. I think, I think at this point we should, I should say, Pete Shelley, God rest his soul, actually. What an absolute genius that one was. I think went to one of, uh, a book event of his, actually. About three months before. Dave Haslam. Yeah, with Dave Haslam. Yeah, what a great night that was. And it's sad. I mean, and this is we don't we don't cherish people enough, do we? No, no. Someone like Pete, you know, they buzz buzzcocks never weren't on their arse, always doing gigs, always yeah, doing yeah. fairly. Well, big they, they, gigs, they couldn't they couldn't not do gigs. Yeah. It wasn't he, he wasn't retired into his chateau no. in the south of France on what he made from ever falling love, which that's not, not right, really, is it? Considering you know he. he I know. Well, nobody can these days. The way the music industry is now, nobody, nobody retires on their earnings anymore. No. They don't think maybe Taylor Swift might. I think Ed Sheeran will be all right for the time being. <laughs> well, let's not focus on them. Cause they're <laughs> shit, <aren't> they? yeah. <laughs> I like Taylor Swift. I've seen her many times. Um, I wanted to talk about Fall, though. Okay. Now you, I know you had qualms about this. You weren't I did. sure about putting in your own. Oh, I was. Band. I was. I was sure. I didn't want to. Who persuaded you? It was uh, 
Ian from uh, Root. From Root, yeah. Uh, well, the reason I went because everybody calls him Selwyn. All oh, right. But his name's Ian. And I, for a while, I thought, is it, well, why has he done this? Is it some kind of literary thing whereby? So it's like he wants to make the company look bigger. And apparently it's because he looked like Selwyn Froggy. I don't know if anybody remembers <laughs> Selwyn Froggy. But anyway, Selwyn convinced me that it wouldn't... It, it, because they fit the remit completely. They were in Pluto, they were a Manchester band. and So I did it kind of a luxury. But I, it was a bit of a difficult one to pitch, really, because I'd been, I'd been banging on about, you know, these artists who I think are absolute geniuses. I mean, having said that, so the way I did it was, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll treat the rest of the band as geniuses and I'll go on for the ride, really. I think that was the only way I could do it. Because Mark e. Smith, I mean, it's a, it's a, he was a genius in a lot of ways. He wasn't the easiest person in a lot of ways either, but then geniuses often aren't. But, um, when did you last see Mark? Last, last saw him, we, we will have been just before they went to America in um, 1998 on that ill-fated tour. Yeah, I never, never saw him. Well, Steve never saw him either, no. And we were, we, if you've read the big midweek, you'll know why that is the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've been doing, I've been doing some research about the fall, I've been doing some writing about the fall, and I found this interview with Mark, and it was like three weeks before they went to America in 1998, and he did not have a good word to say about that band at all. He was already in the mood for a fight before they set off. I mean, American tours always went a bit weird with, with uh, the fall. The first, if you get through the first bit of an American tour, then you were all right, but. That they kicked off and broke up, and then the next lineup of the band, which Steve Trafford in, who I'm in a band with now, and they split up three, four days into the American tour. It was just something happened to Martin, but all the know what it is. But it was an ugly time. And he was, I mean, fair play to the guy. He couldn't get arrested. Well, he could, he could get arrested. <laughs> um, he could literally get arrested. He couldn't figuratively get arrested after that night. And he brought it back, and he, you know, they were great. And that last lineup of the band lasted ten years, and he made, he made the lie of that. Dave Simpson's book that, you know, Mark Smith just, you know, trawls through members like, you know, looked in the phone book and said, you'll do them. Um, but the last lineup lasted 10 years and they, they were, you know, you see their comments when he died, they were genuinely heartbroken when he died, you know, so. T -t -t he must have changed, I think, in some ways. He must, I think he was a better person at the end, I think. I think we're just all compassionate and those of us who saw the pictures or were at those gigs where Mark was wheeled on in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. You can't help but just feel... Well, that, there was we a great... Know there's yeah. something, you know, that, yeah, he's yeah. not going to be around yeah. for much longer. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a great quote from Elena, who was his wife, the fact that he died, and she said, uh, I've done gigs with Mark where his it's, it's stitches are tearing and he's being wheeled on with a leg implant in a wheelchair. And you've got some 25-year-old saying he's only had eight hours sleep the night before. Like, what, what are you moaning about? You know, so you can't... It, whatever he expected of his band, he expected it of himself ten times more, I think. Well, you were then, so when you went in to do perverted by language, you yeah. were there long. I mean, it was, you're not like Fleetwood Mac. You're not well, like it took a week, I think. I think it was, I think it was a week. We were in there. Is there a sense of going into that space? Oh, because you're a George Division fan. You, you played with them at the Bale, yeah. Bale didn't you? I played with George, I saw George, yeah. I didn't play with them at Bon Vella, I was there. I, 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 never, I never played with George Division, no. I saw them a number of times. I was a massive Joy Division fan. Uh, no. So was there a sense going into... No, no, they're, they're, that's Pluto, that's not so, Strawberry, well, wasn't it? The Clash then, or anything? Yeah, yeah, was, that, no, there the wasn't. The I, knew, I knew the Clash... It seeped through the wall. I knew the Clash had been in there, because they showed the video on Top of the Pops. Well, they, one week they were on, and they had Legs and Cold Dancing to Bangor, I remember that. <laughs> Which was terrible. But, and then I think they showed some of the video, and you can see that it's Pluto. And it was fa sort of fairly well known that they'd been in... I didn't know anything about... Herman's Hermits or that yeah. history. I'm not sure I'd have cared as a, as a callow youth. Uh, Steve says he knew in the book, but I, th I think that might be a retcon. I think he might have found that out and put it back in. I'll, I'll have to ask him. I don't, I don't know. But um, I wasn't aware of the history of them and the Manchester thing. No, it was just great to be able to record and go home, basically, which is the same as Eric Stewart and they would say in the first place. It's a, it's a weird thing, that. It's not something you do very often, is record and then go home. Your mum's cut your tail whatever. Because you're either away or you know you're locked in or you're in the pub. <laughs> you're in the pub for seven of the twelve hours that you're paying 120 pound an hour for. You're the drummer though. You're the first thing you do in the studio is set up the kit. That takes That's eight it. Hours, it takes for, it? Yeah, it does take eight hours. Yeah. You know, all that crap. And, uh, and but uh, well, they're all in a pub. And then, but we spent a lot of time in the pub in the fall recording. And that was good for the, because uh, the old garret, was, which was kind of, yeah. kind of, we used to go in there all the time, because I used to go to a club across the road called the Cypress Tavern, and so I'd spent a fair bit of time in the old garret before the fall of recording. I spent even more time once we were in there. 
I'm just looking at the time, and we've talked for about four to five minutes, and there's a lot of people here, and I, I think I think we might get a few questions. Okay. They'll be hesitant at the start. So how do we get up that hesitancy bit? I know we pick on someone, but I'm not going to do that. Does anybody have a question for Paul? This is what you get. Yeah, yeah, they have to stop the filming there. That's going to be... What was the first pub gig or, or place you played in in Manchester? The first place we played in... Um, with the fall, would it will have been? Um, where would that have been? Uh, that's a good question. I think it was in Rafters, which Rafters, was yeah. yeah, I think so. I think that was the first place. Was I was somewhere down to Oxford. It was o Oxford Street. Yeah. So yeah. there was a, there was two clubs. Yeah, there was one yeah. upstairs yeah. and Rafters it was downstairs. Was downstairs. Yeah. Rafters. I remember. I can it. Tell yeah. By the name. Yeah, yeah. So everybody played in Rafters. Yeah. We used to go to Rafters every week. We had them. Um, there was a guy called Alan Wise, who used to run it. And everyone you've mentioned tonight is dead. Yeah, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? Well, Alan Wise, happy, what, happy cheery note. What a legend he was, Alan Wise. But he used to let us in for nothing, so we used to go every week. So rather than, we used to go to the bands every week, so I saw Altered Images there, Orange Juice, Bow Wows. This time them. last year, we had James Young, who wrote the book, Nico, the songs that yeah, yeah. on the radio, which is essentially about Alan Wise yeah, yeah. and Nico. So uh, I've got a Nico story, actually. My claim to fame. Tell us your Nico in story. In Rafters. I was sitting in Rafters. We were sitting in Rafters waiting that she played there. If you ever saw it, Nico, take this opportunity to think of that next yeah. question. Nico, she used to play on this little pedal organ. Yeah, yeah. You'd be like this, she'd be pedaling away. And uh, she played like, she did the end like a 15 minute, but you know, the end by the doors yeah. with her on this pedal. Oh, God, it was depressing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she did a gig and uh, we were sat there in rafters. I think there was somebody else on, I think. It might have even been the Blue Orchids, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, they chewed with her on that. Yeah. Nico came up to me and she said, Germanic, like, pass me my tape. <laughs> Pointing at just behind me. Sorry, what? Pass me my tape. So I was looking behind and I can't see a tape there. There's this big bit of black cloth. I picked it up and I was looking around. There's no tape in them. No, no, my cape. The black cloth there, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so Nico's asked me for a cape. That, you can't get better than that. The gothic story, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm taking all the way back to New York, 19. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> Did anyone think of a question in that time? Because I've got one if you haven't. Sir Ian. Yeah, I've got one. Um, Sir Ian, the is in the yeah. Neither realm. The two drum lineup. Never seen the fall with the two drummers. Is it easy doing that? Silly question, but it playing with two drummers. No, it's not actually. It's it's really strange to get. It's easy once. You know, it's like anything. Once you get there, it's all right. Yeah. But it's it's. I don't know. You, it's a bit like playing with a click track. If the click track doesn't keep perfect time. <laughs> So it is a bit, it does take a bit of getting used to, and we had to, we had to do a fair bit of work. And it was a kind of matter of principle, really, because I don't think Mark expected it to work. I think he was in a bit of a double bind where he wanted Carl back in a band, but he couldn't really get rid of me because my brother was in the band. So he said, well, we'll have two drummers, and fully expecting us, because Carl, I don't know, another legend, he's still alive. Yeah. He's, he's a great bloke, but he's not the easiest going bloke in the world. And he, he could have me for breakfast, basically. He was, and I was a massive fan of Carl's. I was completely in awe of him. And he was a bit of a bully, and he was quite hard as well. So we worked on it, but he said, well, if he's going to have two drummers, we're going to make it work. So we, we did quite a bit of work, and we got it great, actually. And it was real, real privilege to be in a band it with two drummers. Great. It's, it's it did sound great. It sounded all right, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm quite pleased. I was quite pleased with it. Well, no, it was great. It, once you get it, it's really good. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it wasn't particularly easy. I mean, you do say that's one of the reasons you're in Pluto, because you can't fit two drums in a No, no, because we, we, did, we did hex induction hour, and what, one of the things is the physical space to get two drum kits in. So we did hex induction hour in uh, this place in Hitchin, and whenever you read uh, accounts of it, they always say in this abandoned cinema in Hitchin, when it was like we saw sort of prize the, the corrugated iron off the door and <laughs> climbed in. It was a proper studio, yeah. and it was a lot of, they did a lot of them, you remember BBC... In college or whatever they were, they yeah, had live concert, gigs. Yeah. So they had, so they had a proper studio upstairs, and they ran all the wires down to the stage so that they could do live recordings. So we picked that, and we could because we could put two drunkards on the stage, and you could do it from there. So that was why that was. But the problem with that was that it was sixteen track, and once you've got two drunkards, sixteen tracks isn't a lot of tracks. Really. So, hence we ended up in Pluto because that was a twenty-four track studio, and it was cheap and it was near home. So it was all fate really. That was why we ended up there. One of the things that Paul's famous about is um, doing the most John Peel sessions. How many sessions do you think you did? I did five John Peel sessions. And what were they like? Great. They were great John Peel sessions because they were like a commando raid. There was no time for any nonsense, you know. Yeah. 
and they had a subsidised canteen as well, which <laughs> was always good. So he was, they were great because he just, it wasn't like I say, there was no, I mean, there were, to be fair, with the fall, there was less nonsense than a lot of bands. But we, we were talking about this the other day. You could go in there, you do go in there and do four tracks in eight hours. Yeah. And half the time they sound better than the album that we spent six months on, don't we? So, but there, there was a complete absence of any nonsense, basically. You go in, you bang it, and it was like doing a gig. You got a little bit of chance to tweak it, but I always, I always loved doing the jump hill things. They were, they were fantastic. Made a veil, which the BBC is selling off now, aren't they? Which ridiculously. I mean, I know the property must be worth a small fortune, but good God, the history in that place! You can't believe that they're selling it off. I think the I've, I've got offices in Stratford. I think the new BBC studios opposite where I am. No, I'm, okay. I'm with the Japanese on this. Buildings just you know, tear them down, put new ones up. Tell me about the, the Parthenon. We're going to put a block of flats on the Parthenon because it's... <laughs> they probably suggested that. Yeah, the, no, uh, that's... that's financial with the greatest respect, that's bollocks. I know. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask, though, uh, you're an author now, Paul. You've I am an written, author, yes. You've written a book. Yeah. Have you always been a writer? No, well, sort of. Diaries? No, sort no, diaries. never did a diary. I mean, it would have been great. Nobody in the fall ever did a diary. Because I always said that... To, to Mark Raleigh, why he wouldn't write a book, you know, you should write a book, but I can't, you can't remember any of it, he can't remember any of it, he's got a terrible memory, but uh, no, I didn't, the reason that I became an author, fully enough, I decided to do a degree in English Lit, right. um, I, I got my A-levels, and Mark made me do my A-levels, when I joined the fall at 16, he said, you can't just leave school at 16 and just be an ill-educated drummer, you're going to have to get your A-levels, so I did English Lit from the A-levels, and then I made 35 years later, I did my degree, and I did a degree in English Literature. And one of the things you had to do was a piece of life writing. And I have to go away with work to America a lot. And while I was there, I went to see The Who at the um, Red Wing Stadium in Detroit. So I thought, I've got, you know, one of the things you do when you go away, you sat around, nothing, hours and hours. So I wrote a review of, this, a review of The Who at this place and I kind of tried to make it a bit more sort of a Mancunian in Detroit and yeah. seeing the parallels between Detroit and that kind of and the review of the Who as well. And I did it and I did got a good mark for it. So then it got I got in touch with John Robb. And he has the, he has this online magazine called Louder Than Work Louder Than War and he published it. And then Selwyn, who was Steve's publisher, read it and said, I really like that. What, what would you like are there anything you'd like to write about that? Well, you should mention that. I got this piece of paper out of the back pocket, and I said, "I really like." That's what I said. I really like to write about the studios in Manchester. And I had an idea then just to do a chapter on Pluto, chapter on Strawberry, chapter on Cargo in Rochdale. Yeah. But then when I started researching it, I found the, the story of these two studios with the two with the 1960s Manchester bands both starting studios. I thought, well, that's the beginning and the middle and end. I can't. I, I would be diluting it to put more in, really. So then it, be, it, it became and it became this fantastic. Well, I think it's a fantastic, whether it's fantastically told, you'll have to find out if you read the book, but it's a fantastic story that it starts off with these 60s beat boomers and it ends up with the Stone Roses at the end of when studios really mattered. And studios as a, as a sort of special place kind of dies once you get into massive digital recording. You can't anywhere now. And so they don't, you know, they, all the big studios, apart from Abbey Road possibly, but, you know, all these massive iconic studios are on the way out, they don't, people don't need them anymore, so, and that kind of combined with the Stone Roses, so it was a beginning, a middle and an end, so it was a book, so that, that was where it ended up. Does anybody have any questions? Ralph? I just, um, and then behind you. Right at the start, you sort of said, you know, perhaps a little jokingly, that there was like an Old Testament and a New Testament yeah. for the 60s, and, and then, you know, stuff from 76 onwards. I mean, without being too poke-faced about it, I wonder, you know, if you think there's anything in that about sort of like a fervour or a sense of mission about music in Manchester? And if so, who has it? And I think there is, and I've said it before. Um, Eric Stewart said, looked at Manchester, the London music scene and said, well, why do we have to do it down here? You know, let's do it in Manchester. And similarly, Buzzcox, Buzzcox, um, they went to see the Six Pistols and they didn't say, let's save our uh, pocket money and go back next week. They said, let's bring it to Manchester. Why, does it, why, why aren't the Sex Pistols playing in Manchester? And if nobody else is going to put them on in Manchester, we'll do it. And I think there is something in that. I think there's something in that Mancunian sort of, no, we're not going to pay your tariffs to Liverpool. We're going to build a ship in Allen and we're going to have the sixth biggest port in the country 40 miles in. And I think there's something in that, I think. 
and I think it's a Mancunian trait that needs to be celebrated. And so yeah, I don't think it's pole face at all. I think it's I think it's a fact. Tony Wilson again used to say, "Wouldn't it have been fantastic if the Beatles, and instead of spending their money at Abbey Road or, yeah. or building a shop on the most expensive street in the most expensive yeah. part of Mayfair, yeah. had invested in Liverpool, how that would have been a game changer?" It would. I think that would. That's a massive. Uh, I mean, they didn't do much wrong, the Beatles, but I think they left Liverpool as soon as they had three pence to rub together and never really went back in any... I mean, he did later in the end, Paul McCartney, and, you know, he did that. I mean, that's given the yeah. big thing back. But the Beatles themselves they couldn't get out of there fast enough, I don't think. Like Noel and Liam and... Well, they're, they're honorary scousers in my book, then, Noel and Liam. <laughs> There was another question. Hello. Can you shout? Sorry, we it's not reach. Yes. If you were able... Probably all three, to be honest. <laughs> what would you say to him? What would you talk about? I'd, I, what, I, I think it was the thing I would like to have done, and it would, it's completely beyond my remit to have done it, I would think to repair the relationship between Mark and our Steve would have been a great thing, I think. And I think there wasn't enough of a problem. Nobody really did that much on they were both in a bit of a bad way and neither of them were the nicest but I think Steve would tell you that himself when they split. And there was a massive mutual respect and they made some fantastic album, uh, albums together and fantastic work and they fell out in the middle of a tour when everybody was going crackers. And if in the cold light of day was it but he never they never really and it was a real shame I think. About, that's why I would I'd say, you know, why aren't you talking to our Steve? Because you've fallen out of a bugger already. And I think it was a real shame, and I think it was to his detriment that he didn't, he wasn't able to make the step mark. I don't think because he did respect. I mean, he, he was a bit, he's an inveterate sort of revisionist, Mark. So two days after Steve had gone, Steve was rubbish, and he never needed him, you know. And he'd stick by that, and he'd believe it. I think, uh, but it, in his heart of hearts, he must have known that this, he'd had been in this band for twenty years, and. What a shame for it to have ended like that over, over fuck all, really. You know, the, the stupid arguments on tour when everybody was off their heads. And it's, it was a pointless thing, and he, he, he never forgave Steve. Uh, and the big thing he never forgave us was getting in a band with Bricks as well. He was really, really, really pissed off by that, I think. For, for some, again, some unknown reason. But uh, we were banned from his funeral, man. We weren't allowed to go, you know. He left work, but he didn't want us there. I mean, I wasn't going to go anyway. I had spoken to the guy in... 30 years or something. I wasn't going, but Steve would have gone. But we weren't allowed. We're going to end there. Your publisher today tweeted and said you were going to get the first train back. I'm not getting the first Good. train back. So you come for a pint? I will come for a pint. Fantastic. Yes, indeed. Um, Are you getting him in though? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got a train to catch. Sorry, mate. <laughs> I like this bit in the in the book, the, you end on this note, which I hope you don't mind me reading. Not at all. I've expressed justifiable pride in the achievements of my hometown without the xenophobic undertones that often accompany pride in the achievement of one's country. A distinct distaste for that brand of flag wa waving is why I always feel more comfortable supporting Manchester United than England. For most of us, the rivalry between Manchester and Liverpool, for instance, can be celebrated and enjoyed because it doesn't come with the extra baggage of an assumed superiority. Though Manchester is clearly better. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Hanley, everyone. Thank you. That's good. That's good. That's good. Don't embarrass him and London and Walthamstow by leaving these books. That's all we've got. Uh, there are tenor, I think. Grab a book, get Paul to sign it, and take it to the cash desk downstairs, and they will uh, take your money off you. And uh, thank you all for coming. If you are able to hang around, um, yeah, uh, I suggest we repair to Mirth, Marvel, and Maud, and that's simply because there's a jazz band in the Victoria, the oh, right. Tross. And they might be too noisy. But well, there's a great history about Mirth, Marvel, and Maud, which we will great. regale okay. you with. Paul, have me again. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Anything that involves avoiding jazz is good for me. <laughs> the last refuge of the talentless jazz. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, I've got a pen, yeah. Happy New Year!